I think the, the right values for science and the respect and um, for, for data is really, really important. Fundamentally, you should be aimed at improving knowledge of the world in a, a process that is really uh, quite ethical and idealistic. And I think you need to constantly hang on to that. I don't think of science as having the, the ethos that you've just described. Let's talk about that. What is the ethos? If you're there to find out how the world works, and if you're prepared to cut corners by which I mean ignoring things that don't fit with what you, you believe to be correct, um, or um, to speak up data that isn't quite as clear as it should be, that's usually seen as a sort of ethical problem of cheating. But in addition to that, it's stopping you getting to your ultimate goal, which is to understand how it works. Because if this data you don't like is actually real, my word, you've got to take account of it. And if you're not taking account of it, you are not getting to your goal. So although we view it as an ethical issue, I think I prefer the word you use, the right ethos. In addition, it's more than that. It's fundamental to actually producing the knowledge, reliable knowledge, that you need for good science. Let's talk about the importance of science. Mm. Why should anybody care about science beyond a certain fundamental, elemental level? Well, I think there's two answers to that question. One is um, the contribution it makes to culture and civilization. When the first director, I'm blanking on his name, of the Fermilab Accelerator was being um, interviewed, cross-examined cross in the house in Capitol Hill, and he was asked the question, what use would the accelerator be for the defense of the country? And his answer was, he did not think it would be of any direct use for the defense of the country, but he thought it made the country worth defending. Very mm -hmm. nice point. And what he was really saying, of course, is that a, a country that respects culture, civilization, and knowledge needs defending. But of course, science does much more than that. Society invests in science because the knowledge that's acquired through it can be used for the public good in the most general sense. It is very difficult to imagine any minute of your day or anybody else's day that is not influenced in some way by scientific discovery. It is, in fact, the driver, in my view, of much of economic growth and also all the things that we care about, protecting the environment, knowing about climate change, being able to assess the uh, quality of water and so on. All of these rely on science. So they're the two things, I think, that are crucial for it. Well, you mentioned the economic benefits of it. Fair or unfair to say that the economic dominance of the most of the 20th century of the United States was science-based? I think it's a reasonable statement. Um, I think it's sometimes a little difficult to know, as economists love to be able to argue, that a certain percentage, 32, 34, 37 <laughs> percent, um, was due to that. Um, a knowledge economy is important, and sometimes when people ask me, we'll prove it, I say, well, imagine an ignorant economy and does that work? In other words, if we don't have knowledge, could you imagine how we could drive our, our economy? I think the United States has been extremely liberal in its thinking about science. So in the public sphere, it funds open research that's publicly available um, across the world, but in the United States in particular. And then, of course, commercial interests can pick that up and it goes into a more closed structure because for a commercial advantage, but it relies on that public base. One is for the generation of the knowledge, two is for the manpower and women power that are generated that can um, fuel um, the uh, uh, commercial uh, work, and thirdly, uh, just a culture that out of knowledge you can generate um, interesting applications. You need the right culture for it, and that's exactly what the US has, or much of the US has, and I would argue is um, a very, very significant contribution um, to the economy here and to the great quality of life that the United States enjoys. So they must keep preserving and supporting their basic science. You've been so generous with your time and your thought, but I can't resist asking you, and keep in mind, I've spent most of my career in radio and television, primarily in television. And television, it leads to 
arrogance, it leads to egoism. And in science, there is this perception that because, particularly in the upper reaches of science, you deal with things that people by and large don't understand, there's this mm. feeling of arrogance. It must exist. And how did you resist it yourself? It does exist, and we have to be very wary of it. We have to have the humility, first of all, of recognizing in our own profession how much we do not understand. So even in our own research, our own professional activity, we need to be, have some humility. When it comes to interacting with society, with elected political representatives, with the public at large, we cannot retreat into, believe me, I'm the expert. We have to do more than that. There are experts, and I, as I've argued, you need to listen to experts. But the experts have got to get out there and make their case. They've got to listen to what the issues are. They've got to engage. Many scientists are no good at that sort of thing. We've got to be honest about it. Some are. We need to encourage those who are good at talking to the public to engage. And that all has to be part of the system. So I think you're right. We do have a challenge. It's easy to be arrogant but very dangerous to be arrogant and we have to avoid it. Mm -hmm.